Well, good evening to all of you. We're certainly thankful for the opportunity that we have to come together this evening at the five o'clock hour to worship our Heavenly Father once again. We're thankful to all who have led us up to this point and thankful that you are here. We have a good number with us. I knew a lot would be gone with uh, taking their, their teens and uh, children to Maywood, and uh, that's where some are, but uh, we certainly have a good number uh, with us this evening. We thank you for being here as we get ready now to enter into the study portion uh, of, our, of our worship this evening. We're going to begin in Exodus chapter 1. If you would like to open your Bible to Exodus chapter 1, I want to make a few uh, marks, remarks to, to introduce the lesson, and uh, then I will we'll kind of work our way up to where David read for us just a moment ago uh, in our, our scripture reading. But uh, as you know, the history of Israel, when you read the book of Genesis, and you study this book, and as it comes to a close, Joseph, uh, under the providence of God going back to Genesis 37 has brought his family into Egypt uh, his dad his brothers and the family uh, just a large family at that time maybe uh, a, a small tribe if you will but uh, that's who they are going in uh, to Egypt at this time and all is well for them at this time and that period of time uh, when it comes to the Pharaoh and the Egyptians and showing kindness uh, to the people of Israel. But when you turn the page from Genesis 50 to Exodus chapter 1, so we're in the second book of the Bible, the second book of the Old Testament, we're looking to the book of Exodus, a 40 chapter book. Uh, when we go to the very next page in Exodus chapter 1, you see that things well, they're just, they're just not uh, going in a favorable way, uh, if we can say it that way, and it's putting it lightly for the people of Israel anymore. New generation of people, many generations, has uh, passed by this time. And in Exodus chapter 1 and verse 7, the children of Israel were fruitful and increased abundantly, multiplied and grew in exceedingly mighty, and the land was filled with them. We see, of course, all a part of God's plan uh, allowing this people to become a nation, to become a, a mighty people, multiplying. And uh, that's what is going on in Exodus chapter 1 and verse 7. And you see that this leads into some bad times uh, for the people of Israel. That's not limited to Exodus chapter 1. It's easy to read, you know, the first three chapters and, and think that it's all just at one time. But that's not the case. Many years pass from Exodus chapter 1 to Exodus chapter 3. A new Pharaoh, as a matter of fact. Uh, it's, it's not the same Pharaoh in Exodus uh, uh, 3 as it is in uh, chapter 1. But um, when, you, or, or when we get down into Moses and that of the, uh, the ten plagues. If you notice beginning in verse 8, Exodus chapter 1 and verse 8. Now there was a new king over Egypt who did not no, Joseph. That is a verse that I think about often when I remind myself the work that I do as a Christian. Not, not necessarily a preacher, but anything that I'm doing as a Christian. You know, it's not about me. It's not about me. And, and there's going to come a time if the Lord delays his return that no one's going to remember my name. And with all due respect, not yours either. But they can remember that we pointed people to God if we continue to point people next generation and continuing to point people to God. That's what we need to do. We need to make sure that it's all about God. Now, of course, what we're talking about here with this new generation of people here, this one didn't really care about the days of Joseph. He did not care about any of that or anything like that. He said to his people in verse 9, Look, the people of the children of Israel are more and mightier than we come let us deal shrewdly with them lest they multiply and it happen in the event of war that they also join our enemies and fight against us and so go up uh, and so go up out of the land in verse 11 therefore they set taskmasters over them to afflict them with their burdens as exodus begins it's bad times for the people of, e of Israel. The Egyptians, they're not kind to them. They're, they're making life hard on them. 
If you drop down to verse 16, the Pharaoh uh, said, when you do the duties of a midwife, speaking to the Egyptians, when you do the duties of a midwife for the Hebrew women and see them on the birth stools, if it is a son, then you shall kill him. But if it is a daughter, then she shall live. The world becomes extremely evil when we get away from God. Here, here he's going to do this and he did it. You think about Herod in Matthew chapter 2, to all the male children, two and younger in that area, hoping that he would get lucky or by chance kill Jesus as being one of these male children. How sad it is. In verse 22, in verse 22 of Exodus chapter 1, so Pharaoh commanded all his people saying, Every son who is born you shall cast into the river, and every daughter you shall save alive. This Pharaoh, he's doing all he can to try to stop the growth of the Israelites. He does not want them to multiply anymore, and that's the times that you're looking at. When you get into chapter 2 and verse 15, you see the birth of Moses. The faith of Moses' parents that you read about in Hebrews chapter 11. And the birth of Moses in Hebrews chapter 2. And uh, uh, just in chapter 2 when you get down to verse 15. When Pharaoh heard of this matter. When uh, Moses of course had uh, killed an Egyptian. He sought to kill Moses. But Moses fled from the face of Pharaoh and dwelt in the land of Midian. And he sat down by a well. So in chapter 2 you have the birth of Moses. His parents hiding him. You have also Pharaoh going to kill him. It was during this time that Moses lived in Egypt. But you notice that God was with the Israelites. God was with the Israelites in chapter 2 verses 23 through 25. God heard their cries. He heard their pleas. When you get into chapter 3, beginning in verse 7, Exodus chapter 3 and verse 7, beginning, the Lord said, I have surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt, have heard their cry because of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. So I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them from the land to a good and large land, to a land flowing with milk and honey. We see that God is heard. God is going to take care of them. God is going to take them to the land of the Canaanites and the Hizzites and the Amorites and the Perizzites and the Jebusites. In verse 9, he says, Now therefore, behold, the cry of the children of Israel has come before me. I have also seen the oppression with which the Egyptians pressed them. So that is the land. That is what they're dealing with. And I want us to focus on verse 10 for just a moment. Exodus chapter 3 and verse 10 Come now, therefore, and I will send you to Pharaoh that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. Here is a point that I would circle in my Bible, the beginning point of the salvation of the children of Israel from the Egyptians. Yeah, now it's all a part of God's plan going back, I realize. But you see in verse 10, God saying, I'm going to send you. And we're going to deliver my children, my people, the people of Israel, out of Egypt. Now open your Bible to Exodus chapter 12. Our entire study this evening will come from the book of Exodus. And what I want to notice with you, the lesson is titled, do not give up in the wilderness. And, and, and this is a period of time, the wilderness wanderings that begins in about chapter 12 and really on into chapters 14 and 15, that period of times when you sometimes divide the Old Testament into periods. You heard of the wilderness wanderings where they go out into the wilderness and there they are for all of those years. That's the wilderness wandering. So we're talking about not giving up during the wilderness. Don't give up in the wilderness and what I want us to do this evening is to begin in chapter 12 and I want to notice a series of events with you that takes us to the rebellion the, 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 there was a lot of rebellion but I want to notice that, 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 that one that would come after Moses descends from the mountain I want to notice that so you might want to put your ribbon marker in the book of Exodus uh, we will from time to time. What I want to do is make uh, an, an application, a direct application to each of these events, to the church or the Christian period of time. We won't always look at the New Testament verse, 
but I'll mention it and from time to time we might look at it. So uh, you might want to use your ribbon marker to help go quickly back to the book of Exodus. Let's notice together, do not give up in the wilderness from Egypt to the wilderness to Passover. Exodus chapter 12 verses 1 through 3. Now the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt saying, This month shall be your beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. Speak to all the congregation of Israel saying, On the tenth of this month every man shall take for himself a lamb according to the house of his father, a lamb for the household. Now all that has happened from Exodus chapter 3 and verse 10 to where God says, I'm going to save my people, we're going to deliver them from Egypt to this point is the plagues, the, the plagues that, that, we, that we read about. And now we're, we're coming to the death of the firstborn, the tenth plague. You see the Passover given in Exodus chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. Quite often you will hear those who are leading us around the Lord's Supper use Exodus chapter 12 as a reminder of when the Lord's Supper was instituted when they were partaking of the Passover. John chapter 1 and verse 29. John the Apostle writing what John the Baptizer said about Jesus. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Don't give up in the wilderness. They, God heard their cries. He's going to take them out. He had a plan for them. He gave them this Passover lamb. God hears our cries. He knows. He understands. He takes us out of sin. He gave his son as our Passover lamb, the great lamb, the sinless lamb, so we can have salvation from sin. Still in Exodus chapter 12 and verse 12 beginning, you see obedience. We see obedience in what they were to do. Exodus chapter 12 and verse 12 beginning, for I will pass through the land of Egypt on that night, and I will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast. And against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. If you're interested in an additional study this week, if you're looking for something to study, take some time to study a little bit about the, uh, the Egyptian history and notice that each of the plagues was against one of the gods of Egypt, one of the gods that they served. Here is God uh, having his ultimate uh, victory over all of them. You see in verse 13, Now the blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And the plague shall not be on you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. Now think with me for just a moment. I'm going to... Go to the New Testament book of Romans chapter 6 to uh, help make a parallel about obedience. When we read Exodus chapter 12 and you read what God told them to do with this blood, if you were living in that day and time and the mindset that many have today, some would come away with saying, well, that just that doesn't make sense. God knows that I'm an Israelite. God knows I'm not an Egyptian. Why, why would I need to do that? Because God said to do it. That's why. God, God said, I, I'm, I'll provide. I'll pass you over. I'll, but you, you need to do what, what I'm telling you to do. Obedience. In Romans chapter 6, this entire chapter is about obeying God. And, and I want to focus just on one verse, verse 17 Romans chapter 6 and verse 17. But God be thanked that though you were slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. He's saying, you know, you, you, you were serving sin. You were, were in that life, but you have obeyed. You've obeyed from the heart. What you were told to do, that form of doctrine, that which you were told to do. We do what God tells us to do in the Bible. If you go back to Exodus chapter 14, remember, don't give up in the wilderness. They, they're, they're, they leave Egypt, but what we're going to find is so many of them give up. And that goes to the reading that David read for us in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 
And in verse 11 of 1 Corinthians chapter 10, it even says, you know, th this is for our learning so we can learn, so we can remember what happened. What, what David read in the first 13 verses of 1 Corinthians chapter 10 is really a summary of the book of Exodus. It's really what it is, especially verses 12 through the, uh, excuse me, chapters 12 through the end of the book. When you get to Exodus chapter 14, you see God's salvation at hand once again. His salvation from the people of Egypt, from Pharaoh the king. In Exodus chapter 14, verses 13 through 16, you see the Red Sea crossing. Moses said to the people, Do not be afraid. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. There it is. Which he will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall see again no more forever. The Lord will fight for you and you shall hold your peace. And the Lord said to Moses, why do you cry to me? Tell the children of Israel to go forward. In verse 16, but lift up your rod and stretch out your hand over the sea and divide it. And the children of Israel shall go on dry ground through the midst of the sea. I think it's interesting that the Bible says when, he talks about, when it talks about the Red Sea crossing that they'll go across on dry ground. The same is true in the book of Joshua. You remember the, 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 the waters of Jordan are stopped so they can walk across. And it says on dry ground. I, th I think that's really interesting to think about. I mean, it's amazing enough to split the sea. But the Bible specifically says, so the, you know, the, the ground doesn't dry out that, that quickly after, after a flood. And here they are. God is taking care of them in everything that they need. In every way that they need, God is taking care of them. So what you see is the Red Sea crossing. There are a number of times in the Bible that God used water to save his people. That was God's decision, and he did. Noah and the flood, Genesis chapter 6. The Red Sea crossing in Exodus chapter 14. We see it with Naaman uh, being healed from his leprosy in, uh, in the book of uh, 2 Kings chapter 5. No, a number of times you see such to be the case. And you see that in New Testament salvation. There's a lot of verses that we can consider, but I, I want to share with you just one. In Acts chapter 8, when Philip is called away from Samaria, and here he is alone with this eunuch from Ethiopia, just the two of them. And they're reading from the scroll Isaiah, the same text that Jeff read for us this morning, Isaiah chapter 53. I, I believe the eunuch's mind was focused on that. I believe his interest was piqued because he was returning from Jerusalem. What happened in Jerusalem? That's where Jesus was crucified. That's where the church began. No doubt he heard about this while there. And no doubt he was, he, he, he was looking to this to see if it, is, is it really fulfilled prophecy. And, and the eunuch then would ask that question in Acts chapter 8 and verse 36. See here is water. What hinders me from being baptized? And they did it right then and there. Out of nowhere. Because that was how he could render obedience to God. When you go back now to the book of Exodus chapter 15. And I, I mentioned that we'll, with, with, with each of these events, I want to try to make a New Testament application for, for, for we as Christians today. But uh, we're going to keep going back to Exodus. Exodus chapter 15. You see that God provided. God provided. Verses 22 through 25. Exodus chapter 15 and verse 22 beginning. So Moses brought Israel from the Red Sea. Then they went out into the wilderness of Shur. And they went three days in the wilderness and found no water. Remember this period of time now. Officially crossing the Red Sea. You can officially call it the 
wilderness wandering. Some of you probably remember the, the Jewel Miller study uh, films. It's, it's out of habit, most people say film strip, but they're on DVD. And uh, I love those. I, I still like, I enjoy them. I like uh, going back and watching them from time to time. But it talks about the, 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 the period of the wilderness wandering on, on Jewel Miller. So now here they are. But there's no water. Now, isn't it interesting? I don't know if that's the way we should say it or not. But when you think about the people of Israel now in the wilderness, how easily they've forgotten what we read in chapters 1, 2, and 3. Crying out before the Lord. Why is this happening to us? Why are you letting this happen to us? They're killing all of our children. They're killing all, all of our all of our male children. They're, look at the light. They're, they're putting so much work on us. We can't possibly do it. Look how hard it is. Don't you hear us, God? And now they're forgetting. Memory sometimes short when things are not going our way. And we're reminded that God does not always work in, our, in the way that we want him to work. In Exodus chapter 15 and verse 22, there's no water. So when they came to Marah, they could not drink the waters of Marah, for they were bitter. Therefore, the name of it was called Marah. And the people complained against Moses, saying, what shall we drink? What are we going to do? What are we going to do? That goes back to our scripture reading. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. I can't remember the number right now, but you can read it again. How many of them died in the wilderness? Because they complained. So he cried out to the Lord in verse 25, and the Lord showed him a tree. And when he cast it into the waters, the waters were made sweet. God took care of them. God provided for them every step of the way through the plagues to eventually get Pharaoh to let them go. To dividing the Red Sea to where they could walk across it on dry land. To out here in the wilderness, providing Water that they could drink. And in chapter 16, verses 2 through 4, God provided once again the food that they needed. Exodus chapter 16, beginning in verse 2. Then the whole congregation of the children of Israel complained against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. Here are the complaints again. And the children of Israel said to them, Oh, that we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt. One hand, when I read the book of Exodus, I, I read it and I say, what are you thinking? But then I back up and say, I've probably been a lot like them in life. I probably have done the same thing. It's too hot. It's too cold. And on and on and on. There's not enough food. There's too much food. The food isn't good. And on and on and on. I see, unfortunately, myself like these Israelites more times than I would like to. You see, in verse 3, they said, it would have been better to die in Egypt. How quickly they forgotten the Egyptians who were killing their male children. The, the Egyptians who were making work hard on them. That, isn't, isn't that, here, here's a thought to consider. Isn't that the way it is sometimes when we're new into the church? I thought everything was going to be without problems. No problem ever again. God does not guarantee that in this lifetime. But he does in the eternal life. And you see, that's, that's, what, that's one of the things that I think keeps people out of the church or causes people to leave the church. The same, the, the Israelites, they, they seem to have been looking for heaven on earth. And today, people seem to be looking for heaven on earth. There is great joy in it. But sometimes it's, it, it comes in the, in, the, in the package of suffering and not everything the way that we want it. But we know if we endure, if we keep on, if we never give up, Eventually, we will have heaven 
where it is rightfully located. In verse 4, then the Lord said to Moses, behold, I will rain bread from heaven. For has, has God rained bread upon us as his children? Has God provided in abundance for us? I would dare say probably most of us throw away more of God's blessings than we use. And every time we throw away leftovers. God has provided us with so much. We need not complain. The people shall go out and gather a certain quota every day that I may test them whether they will walk in my law or not. Matthew chapter 6 verses 25 through 31. I'm not going to turn to it and read. You know it. Sermon on the Mount. God's saying, I'll take care of you. I'll provide. Just, just put your trust in me. Staying in the book of Exodus chapter 20, verses 1 through 17. I'll not read it. But again, we're making our way through. The, the, don't give up in the wilderness. They, they got their wish. They cried out to God. They cried out to the Lord. Help us do something. God took them out of Egypt. God has them away from those, those evil Egyptians. They've gotten their wish. And now here you have what, what I would suggest to you is the official transition from the patriarchal period into the mosaical period of time. It, you could say it's the book of Exodus, I realize. But here, here now you have this written law given. Beginning with these, these Ten Commandments, again, the first 17 verses, you can, you can read them, the Ten Commandments given. They were not under just Ten Commandments, but you have this beginning point. You have, you have this beginning point with these, I suppose, every other commandment that you read in the rest of the book of Exodus and the Levitical law, and you read it again in the book of Deuteronomy, in one way or another, it can be connected back to these commandments. Here you have the, the foundation of what you need to do Easy to remember, easy to put to practice. If you're putting these to practice, these Ten Commandments, then it'll be easy enough uh, to remember what else you're required to do. Here again, I'm not going to the New Testament, but it's interesting to me to compare Exodus chapter 20 to Acts chapter 2, verses 42 through 47. And really also the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapters 5, 6, and 7. In Exodus 20, you have the beginning of this new period of time, a written law given to the people. And God starts out with these, these Ten Commandments, and from them, he will get uh, into greater detail about what they are to do. In Acts chapter 2, the beginning of the church, in verses 42 through 47, you have just a handful of verses that would teach us what the church was doing and especially in their way of worship. You can go right there and say, okay, what were they doing? And see what they were doing in worship. And then the rest of the New Testament, it, it just, it just it expands on it. And, and we, we learn a little more and a little more as we keep reading the New Testament. And I see the same thing with the Sermon on the Mount. And they're the beginning of our Lord's ministry, his earthly ministry. Here he is with these three chapters, given the base of it. This, it it's, it's, it's the heart. It's the heart. I think that's interesting to consider. But if you're still in the book of Exodus, I do want you to open to chapter 26. I would like for you to open your Bible to Exodus chapter 26 and verse 6. As far as I know, this is the only time that it is mentioned about the tabernacle. But I want to uh, mention this with you. In Exodus chapter 26 and verse 6, you're in the section of the book of Exodus where God is given the instructions for worship. How to build the tabernacle, the material needed, uh, the, the priesthood, the garments that they are to wear. Uh, you see all of this in this section of the book of Exodus, their offerings and what they are to offer. And notice what is said in Exodus chapter 26 and verse 6. You shall make 50 clasps of gold and couple the curtains together with clasps so that it may be one tabernacle. Now we studied about this in our our, our auditorium class last year when we looked at the tabernacle. But think about how you have the, all these different 
pieces that come together uh, uh, that, that God used in the design of the tabernacle from the, the bases or the sockets to the, the frame to the poles that would, were used for stability to the curtains, some on the inside for decoration, some on the outside that were a little more durable to the weather. And all of this, the veils that were in the tabernacle, the courtyard, all of this God used, but he, he worked it together to where these individual pieces could be taken apart and transported, so that's part of it. But when they came together, when the people of Israel were coming to the location where God said to stop, and they, they put it together, this tent-like structure, they clasped together, they came together so that verse 6 of Exodus 26 says it was one tabernacle. Think about how the church is one. And over and over and over we read that in the New Testament. Think, think about how we work together we're all different in our abilities. We're all different in what we do and in our roles. But we work together as one. Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 1. The Hebrews writer in Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 1 says, Now this is the main point of the things we are saying. We have such a high priest. This goes back to the book of Exodus. The priesthood who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord erected and not man. Let every high priest, for every high priest is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices. There it is for is necessary that this one also have something to offer. For if he were on earth, he would not be a priest, since there are priests who offer gifts according to the law who served the copy and the shadow of the heavenly things as Moses was divinely instructed when he was about to make the tabernacle. That's what we read in Exodus. For he said, see that you make all things according to the pattern shown to you on the mountain. So Exodus chapter, excuse me, Hebrews chapter 8, in the first few verses, the Hebrews writer, and throughout this book of 13 chapters, would talk about the tabernacle. Exodus chapter 31. Exodus chapter 31 and verse 12. Don't give up in the wilderness. God brought you into the wilderness. God is providing you for you. He's giving sweet water. He's giving bread. He's giving the tabernacle. He's giving his way of worship, that which is pleasing to him. Exodus chapter 31 beginning in verse 12. The Lord spoke to Moses saying, Speak also to the children of Israel saying, Surely my Sabbaths you, Sabbaths you shall keep. For it is a sign between me and throughout your generations that you may know that I am the Lord who sanctifies you. You shall keep the Sabbath, therefore, for it is holy. Everyone who profanes it shall surely be put to death. For whoever does any work on it, this person shall be cut off from among his people. God at that time told them to keep the Sabbath, the last day of the week, and to keep it holy. They had that which they were allowed to do on that day, and they had that in which they are not allowed to do. We today, when you read Matthew chapter 28 and verse 1, as well as the last chapter of Luke, the last chapter of Mark, and the next to last chapter of John, John chapter 20, we see that after the Sabbath had passed, the Lord was resurrected the first day of the week. In Acts chapter 2 and verse 1 we see that day of Pentecost was the first day of the week and we see that in Acts chapter 20 and verse 7 they were meeting on the first day of the week for New Testament worship Christian worship Exodus chapter 32 this is the point of the lesson Exodus chapter 32 we were working our way up to this point don't give up in the wilderness. God brought you out of Egypt. God has provided for you. God has given his law. God has said, this is what you can do to worship me. This is what you can do to sacrifice. Exodus chapter 32 and verse 1. Now when the people saw that Moses delayed coming down from the mountain, the people gathered together to Aaron, that's the brother of Moses, and said to him, come, make us gods that shall go before us. For as for, for as for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. Well, they're not patient, are they? 
In verse 2, Aaron said to them, Break off the golden earrings which are in the ears of your wives, your sons, and your daughters, and bring them to me. So all the people broke off the golden earrings which were in their ears and brought them to Aaron. And he received the gold from their hand and he fashioned it with the engraving tool and made a molded calf. Then they said, this is your God. O Israel, that brought you out of the land of Egypt. I have never understood idol worship. I know if you're in a land that it is... That is the main thing. It would be challenging to understand anything else. I realize that. If that's all you've ever been around. And these Israelites, that's what they were around in Egypt. But when you stop and think, I can take a piece of wood and I can can make this, this, this beautiful podium out of half of the tree. And then I can take the other half of the tree and I can make a God and say, this is my God to worship. I've never understood that. But yet that's what happens when we get away from the one true God. In verse 5, so when Aaron saw it, he built an altar before it. And Aaron made a proclamation and said, tomorrow is a feast to the Lord. God took them out of Egypt. God provided for them. God gave them all that they needed. It's not all what they wanted, but he gave them all that they needed. In Exodus chapter 32 the rebellion they gave up in the wilderness they didn't want God's way they did not want the way of Moses their leader and you can continue to read on your own time at what happened to them and you can see again going back to 1 Corinthians chapter 10 some of the things that happened to them they get they go let, let, let's let's close it Robbie we're going to get ready to sing but let's go back to that verse chapter 3 and verse 10 I'm going to take you out of Egypt As we read in in, in our study that this is the salvation of the Lord. They left Egypt, but so many of them gave up in the wilderness. Don't leave a life of sin just to give up in the meantime. This, This is our wilderness wanderings. But one day we're going to cross the Jordan, are we not? One day we're going to cross into our eternal home. And we're going to enjoy heaven forever. Don't give up. Keep pressing on. Keep your focus on God. There will be difficult days. There will be days that you might want to give up. There will be days that you might want to complain. There will be days that you might want something else. It's not worth it. Nothing is worth it. Let's not give up in the wilderness. Let's press on until we can cross the Jordan. If we can help you this evening with your journey to heaven, not giving up, beginning your journey, whatever you need to do, please come as we stand and as we sing.